So, welcome to the annual event of the Informality Research Observatory. We're really delighted to welcome speakers from, from around the world and really to help us think through some of the issues around informality and to think about how lessons from the Global South can apply to the Global North and, and, and vice versa. So in the Global South, lives are lived through informal processes. They're through informally built and run cities. In the Global North, we can see that the gig economy is thriving. And yet inclusive approaches to informality are very rare. We know and expect that you'll be a challenging audience. So we planned plenty of time for discussion. We've divided the event into two sessions. For session one, from 12 to 1, we'll have four short presentations uh, from myself, from my colleague Hassan Kamalipur, um, from our postdoc scholar Lena Martinez, and recent PhD Jimli Al Farabi. And Lena's at 6 a.m. and Jimli is at 6 p.m. Lena in Colombia and Jimli in Indonesia. And then we'll be followed by discussion. And at 1 p.m. we'll move on to session two with presentations from Pete Mackey, from Patricia Garcia of um, Amado from Tom Smith and from Adrian Healy, again followed by discussion. So I'm just going to put the program in the chat and I'm going to hand you over to Pete Mackey, my colleague whom I've planned this session with, and he's going to chair and keep us all to time. Brilliant. I get the job of keeping Alison Brown to time. Um, so we've, we've tried to keep us. Uh, look, the starting point is in the true spirit of informality. This is not a webinar. It's a Zoom, um, a Zoom meeting. So you have control of your own mic. Try to turn it off whilst others are talking. Um, and I'm sure lots of things will go, go wrong as we try and upload slides. But speakers, if you can try and keep to eight minutes, the only way that I can can give you any sort of sign. I can't really wave at you because you won't see me as I'll speak. Um, so as we get into eight, you'll hear me coming in towards the end to try and usher you off the stage. Um, other than that, my job is just going to be to collate questions. Um, and I suggest you you either use the kind of raise hand function or, um, or put a, a question in the comments and then I'll I'll bring those questions in once we've been through all of the presentations. So we'll go through all, all four first. So let's begin. Alison, over to you to, to share your screen and, and get us started. Thank you. Um, let me just run my PowerPoint. Oh, come on, computer. And welcome you again to, to this session. I've been tasked with doing two things. First of all, to explain the work of the Informality Research Observatory and then to look at informality in post-conflict settings. So how do we encapsulate the work of 20 years in eight minutes? It's a bit of a challenge and Pete's very tough on timing, so I will give you some highlights. So at Eero, it brings together the work of colleagues at Cardiff in the School of Geography and Urban Planning. We have a very strong urban focus. We've had more than two million pounds of research funding for many different projects. We've worked in more than 20 countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America. We've got a very active PhD and postdoc programme and over 40 international collaborators and very strong links with UN Habitat. And our aim is to explore informal urban processes, both to look at the vulnerabilities of those people involved, how context affects them, and about the, how the opportunities that this understanding has to enable us to manage urban systems better. There's a big literature on urban informality and its definitions, but very briefly, we define it as processes outside regulatory frameworks. And debates swerve from talking about illegality and marginalization or seeing informality as a source of creativity and innovation and debate whether it's place specific or global. So I hope we'll get some more thoughts in this talk. We situate our work in a rights-based framework, looking at human rights and the right to the city. And we like to do research that matters, that is policy relevant to poverty and social inclusion. 
So in terms of themes, my work has been mainly on the informal urban economy, so you'll hear a lot of focus on that in the rest of my few minutes. But we've also looked at spatial issues of access to space, urban morphology, informal land controls, at governance, at the transnationality of informal trade, the governance of Indian border towns is an ongoing project, at fragile contexts, and we take an intersectional approach. And I hope that we challenge misconceptions, for example, that informal work workers don't pay taxes. They do, but often through informal processes. So I'm going to focus very quickly on two projects, one just completed on economic recovery in post-conflict cities, which I undertook with Pete Mackey. And we worked there in five cities, in Karachi, Hargeza in Somaliland, Kathmandu, Dohok in Kurdistan, and Cali in Colombia. And our key findings were that in urban crisis, people construct livelihoods and enterprises for survival. And that if we foster these initiatives, it helps build stability as a platform for economic recovery. This forms an essential bridge between emergency relief and long-term development. So we found different niche economies, but one of those was the replacement economy, the replacement of failed or absent urban services, such as in Cali, Colombia, on the left-hand side, these motorcycle taxis in Siloe, an informal settlement creeping up the hill. And on the right hand side, the two pictures of waste collection and waste recycling. But in the center, we can see informal services, the water delivery by donkeys in Hargeza, or banking. In Cardiff, we couldn't leave that much money on a, in a box by the side of the road. And the critical issue is how to bridge the aid input and the development, the divide between aid and development, which, requ which requires an understanding of informal processes and a do no harm approach, but often these two sectors don't talk well to each other. The second project is ongoing. It's um, called Realigning Response to Protracted Displacement in an Urban World. It's led by IIED, Lucy Hurl at, Earl at IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. And we have a number of other partners at Cardiff, I'm working with Pete Mackey and with Patricia Garcia Amado. And we're looking at Ethiopia and also at, at the livelihoods stream of work. And now more that more than 60% of the world's displaced people live in cities rather than camps, it's time for a rethink of urban policy. And the problem is that people who are displaced in cities often fall outside the remit of humanitarian aid in cities they have choice, choice of where they live and what they do, but very little support. So how can we address this problem? We're building the first large scale evidence base of the outcome of protracted displacement more than five years in camps and urban settings. We're working in four countries, in Afghanistan, in the town of Jalalabad, the neighborhood of Majburabad and Barikab in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa and Asaita in Eastern Ethiopia. In Kenya, looking at Somali, uh, Mali refugees and Adab and Eastley in Nairobi, and in Jordan at Amman and Azraq. And we have three work streams looking at people's well being. How do they survive protracted displacement? At livelihoods, and particularly in the livelihood sector, we're looking at the concept of of displacement economies. So humanitarian aid tends to focus on the individual, but we're interested in the enterprise and the collective impact of that response. And also at governance. And early findings suggest that in Ethiopia, in, in Afghanistan, are significantly disadvantaged compared to host communities, but particularly in the camp of Barakab. And in Ethiopia, where refugees have no right to work, those in Amman find it very difficult to get work, to be self-reliant. So they're dependent on remittances and waiting for a resettlement to third countries, which will never come, a waste of human resources. So we dare to dream what would a world look like without camps. And finally, just in conclusion, in post-conflict settings, there's a critical need to recognize the normality 
of informal self-help for survival and recovery to adopt a do no harm approach to informal urban processes so that we record and understand and support those to reduce vulnerability, not necessarily move towards formality, to foster the informal economy's potential to fill the gaps in urban service provision when governance collapses, to meet people's space and security needs to help build longer term social and economic potential, and to recognize innovation as inherent to urban informality. And from Nepal, thank you. Wow, Pro Professor Brown at just under eight minutes. Oh, that, brilliant. <laughs> a, well done. I'm very, very impressed. That's, I had to practice. That has set the standard for the rest of you and a really good kind of a broad overview and then a, a, a little dive into those two particular very important studies. Fantastic. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions emerging. Um, and I think that's one of the beauties of of the way today's set up. We can't possibly get into the detail we might might want to. So it will be raising questions. Hang on to those, uh, to everybody um, who's joined us and we'll, we'll pick those up in the discussion. So I'll hand over now to Hassam. Hopefully you're able to, to share your slides, Hassam. And then it will be yep. over. That's great, thanks. Uh, I think you should be there. Hello. We can hear you, Hazam. Okay, so can you see the screen now? I can't yet see your slides. Uh, okay, is it there now? I can't. Oh, yeah, it's there. It's because you're such a, you, you've got wonderful images, I bet. That's why. Okay. <laughs> you're live now, Hazam. Thank you. Great. Okay, thanks for that. So, uh, yep, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to be quick, just going through a range of projects that I've been uh, doing over, over the last few years, uh, uh, focusing on questions of, of informality, particularly focusing on the relations between informal and formal. I would start from the point that uh, we cannot explore informality in isolation. Informality doesn't take place in isolation from the context of the city and particularly in relation to formal processes. The theoretical framework I usually adopt is, is, is linked to assemblage thinking, which is about particularly two axes of deterritorization and territorization and how these two as two twofold processes fold into each other places become territorialized and also becoming deterritorialized throughout the process of transformation. And at the same time, looking at the relations between sociality and spatiality. Formal and informal is also one of these two fold conception that resonates with a range of other two conceptions linked to assemblage thinking. For example, the relations between tree-like rhizomic processes being and becoming also the relations between differences and identities, the ways in which places become regulated and unregulated, also the relations between tactics and strategies. Uh, perhaps a few key points that assemblage thinking is uh, against forms of micro and macro reductionism. So that's embedded in the process and also way of uh, criticizing tree-like thinking when it comes to how cities and places work and also adopting a kind of multi-scale of thinking. So uh, to perhaps uh, framing the, the broader discussion is that informality I adopted also as range of activities taking place outside of the regulatory framework and often the state control. And it's a key point to, to make that distinction and avoid particularly reducing reformality to the context of the global south as it takes place and cuts across uh, both cities of the global south and cities of the global north to the extent to which this, these constructed distinctions would uh, uh, bring any useful ideas for thinking, perhaps making also a distinction between optional and necessary informality, I will, as I would term it following uh, the, the, the argument by Devlin making that distinction between desire and needs in relation to informality, informality born out of desire and informality born out of need. And it's critical to make that distinction distinction. Also linking to the Neubert's arguments about informality and the ways in which it works as a safety valve in certain contexts to prevent insurrection and works often, as Caban puts it, civic disobedience to meet basic needs. 
So uh, what uh, I'm going to go through, this was the first project we've been involved, uh, particularly looking at the range of or forms of informality. Uh, and I, I make it specific that I'm looking at three particular forms of informality. If we conceptualize informality as a form of multiplicity, one of them would be informal street vending in public space. The other one would be informal transport and also informal settlement as a verb, as a process of settling through informal processes. So the first one is the uh, informal street vending. In, in this project, we've been looking particularly at the ways in which uh, informal street vending takes place in public space and the ways in which it plays out, particularly looking at the spatiality of informality in relation to public-private interfaces and also mobility within public space. Uh, one of the key points there was that uh, informality and forms of informality in public space, This, in this particular case, it requires negotiation and often works through negotiation with formal businesses and also among other, uh, other agents or key actors in public realm. It's, it's also a form of micro scale design that brings vitality to public space. While it may argue that uh, as, as Donovan puts it, the signifier uh, of, of a city of out of order, but it can also bring vitality to public space. This is an, an image from Medellin and the ways in which informal practices link to formal practices in city. The other project is about the relations between formal and informal modes of transport using isochrone mapping in the context of here is the city of Tehran, the ways in which informal modes of transport in this particular case, motorcycle taxis become quite competitive with formal modes of transport and raising the questions about the extent to which we can wish away uh, uh, different forms of informal transport while they are becoming competitive in public space, competing for the same access network in the city. And also the other project that we've been looking at, particularly looking at, at, the, at the distinctions between formal and informal, criticizing the binary distinction made often between informal and formal process of settlement, looking across different cities, 15 cities in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Middle East, Africa, and South America, trying to unravel the in-between conditions, the conditions that often remain unmapped in when it comes to informality, and also linking it back to, to the process of upgrading and formalization, the ways in which morphologies change in these settlements, also highlighting that the relations between formal and informal not making a dichotomy, but it, it's often a form of twofold, that one becomes another throughout the process. So I'm gonna go through just a few of the examples that we've done uh, looking across these 15 cities in different, very different contexts, socioeconomic and sociocultural included, uh, looking at the cities of Rio, Caracas, Lima, trying to unravel those in between condition. As, as we've noticed, we notice most of the places that we know often incorporate the process of informalization and formalization somewhere in between the two. Uh, the, the links between informal and formal. Also, the other cities such as the Mumbai in India, Jakarta in Indonesia, and also Manila in Philippines. Also looking at Karachi in, in Pakistan, Cape Town, South Africa, and also Nairobi in Kenya, using the same framework. And also another project looking at uh, the ways in which we can adopt a multi-scalar approach at starting from the very small scale of a laneway and going up to the very large scale of a city and a, and a metro scale uh, relations between formal and informal process in cities, drawing on three case studies in, in Pune in India, in Medellin in Colombia, and also in, in Bang Bangkok in Thailand. The other project that we've been working on was to look at the increments of change, the ways in which informal settlements change over time, and also unraveling or exploring to some extent the underlying informal rules of what we call the informal codes that governing the process of change in informal settlements, drawing on different case studies in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and also South America. The other project that we've been looking at was to explore the relations between inside and outside, the ways in which micro scale economies take place in informal settlements, and the ways in which they communicate uh, uh, through public private interfaces. Uh, the other project, the recent one that we've, we've been involved looking at the, at the morphogenesis of, of these settlements, the production of buildings in relation to the production of access network, particularly looking at 
at the process of emergence and also intensification and also focusing on, on the ways in which sediments become saturated and the process of consolidation in, in emerging sediments. This is a case study in Nigeria, an emerging settlement that we've been looking at. The other part of the work, looking at the dynamics of visibility, the ways in which informal settlements become visible or invisible from the gaze of the formal city and the, and the significance of that, outlining the different conditions of visibility and the ways in which it plays out in different cities. This is an example of, of the city of Caracas in Venezuela, that the strategies uh, to, to manage the condition of visibility from blockage to distraction to forms of legitimization of formality. And also perhaps to finishing the point, looking at the not formal and informal in isolation from each other, but thinking about the ways in which while we think about the, the process of formalization upgrading in, in formal settlements here, the case of Comuna Nororiental and also San Javier in Colombia to Yeravada in Puna up there. Uh, while these settlements become formalized and upgrading take place there, we also have the same process playing out in different ways in different contexts. Here from Chandigarh to the right to Cape Town to the left, the ways in which the formal city becomes informalized over time. And this is where my interest particularly lies, particularly looking at, at, the, at, at the time where the designer or the built environment professionals leave and people take over, the ways in which the ordinary takes over and how informality works in relation to that one. Also thinking about all urbanism, incorporate a mix of formal and informal processes, questioning particularly the fixation on form or the final outcome, which seems to dominate the field of the built environment professions, the rigidity of the final outcome. And I guess that would be it. I'm gonna stop there. Thanks. Brilliant, wonderful, Hazam. That was that, crikey, that was a whistle stop tour of a lot of projects. Um, uh, wonderful, thanks for keeping to time as well. Um, so we'll, we'll move on then to, um, we, are, we really are heading all over the world. So we're going to head to Lena who I think is up and ready to present at six o'clock uh, Cali time. So Lena, lovely to see you. Um, I will leave you try and share your slides. Uh, okay, lovely to see you too, Pete. And you. Uh, okay, here you can see my, my screen. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. Thank you. So we are going to get to a study case and we're going to localize in South America in Cali. I'm going to talk about the third largest city in Colombia. Cali is a very interesting place to study informality and many and the, and the many interactions that informality brings uh, in different dimensions in, and in, in the configuration and the social configuration of a city. Uh, Cali has a long history of violence. Probably you have seen it in, in Netflix on Narcos. <laughs> and probably you have heard about the drug cartels that were infamous in the 90s. So this is pretty much Cali. And I don't know if you also saw the news recently. We have a long, long, long strike over a month. And during a month, we weren't able to move within the city. Uh, there were barricades, we didn't have gas, we didn't have food. Uh, so this is, this is a very interesting place to, to study and we move in the dynamics of a city that is growing in the middle class, but also a city that is very stuck in informal uh, dynamics. So I'm going to talk about Cali and the evidence that I'm going to show you, uh, most of them we, we have done a lot of work in police uh, at the research center that I conduct here in, in Cali. Uh, and we have been doing this research with, with Pete and Allison and, and Allison and they have brought many different views of how we can uh, research many of the issues. So in my very short seven minutes, <laughs> I'm going to try to tackle four points. I, I want to talk about, uh, about a little bit of the context of the city. Um, one, one point, even though it's a little bit harder to do it in a couple of minutes, but I, I think it's, it's worth to know uh, the, poli the politics and policies that regulate informal sector in Colombia and Cali. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about crime and informality. And last but not least, I want to talk 
about COVID-19 and the implications for the informal sector uh, with a research we are conducting with Graham, which, which is here in the, in the session today. So this is Cali. You can see here a, a map of the, of the city. Uh, here in the skirts are the, the poorest population. Here is the, a big district called Agua Blanca. And here in the hills is Siloe. So the city, and many other cities in the global south are pretty segregated. And this map that I'm showing you here, it's a geocoding, a georeferencing exercise we did with all the street vendors in Cali in 2019. So each red point, um, yellow point, sorry, represents a street vendor in Cali. Uh, in 2019, we counted over 10,000 street vendors, and I'm going to show some information in three areas. Downtown, which is here, and we counted about 5,000 street vendors in the area. Santa Elena is the largest street market, uh, food street market. Uh, and here, those lines and these dots represent the, the uh, transit system, MEO system, which is the articulated bus system. And we also have collected information here. So I'm going to present information for downtown Santa Elena and Mio, which is the bus system in case you see that information. Um, we had before the pandemic, 50% of the a working age population working in the informal sector, which is huge and it has significant implications for taxes, for regulations, for crime, et cetera, et cetera. And the estimations after the pandemic is about 68% of the population earning their income in the informal sector, um, which is over the, the, the roof. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the policies and regulations, and I'm going to be quite brief here, but I think it's worth it. Uh, we got a new constitution in 1991, um, and the, the, the important thing during the, the new constitution, uh, it was a discussion about if informal uh, economy was a national or a local uh, problem. Most of the time in the, since the new constitution, informal sector has been a local problem. So each local government has the authority to deal as they please or as they can, depending on the resources to regulate and control informal sector. With the new constitution, a new instrument came, which is tutela. And the tutela allows any citizen to claim uh, or to sue the government when we feel that our fundamental rights are violated. And the tutela gave street vendors, with the use of the tutela, they gave the right to use the public space to conduct their economic activities because it was the protection to the right to work. The tutela system changed pretty much. It was a game changer in the way that the informal sector is regulated in Colombia. From there, informal workers, uh, it, it, is, it is prohibited to remove them from the public space. So the cities has been growing and growing and growing in the number of street vendors and informal workers in the streets, which is a way to promote the right to the city, but also it promotes all the informal structures related to the informal sector, such as crime, um, uh, I, for, I forgot the other ones, but crime is one of them. And given the long history of crime that we have in the city, uh, crime is a very pervasive phenomenon that we see everywhere. Uh, here, I want to show you some of the numbers about crime activity. And here I'm presenting some data about different types of crime in downtown and Santa Elena. Uh, we have a significant proportion of informal workers uh, who have been victim of the armed conflict in downtown. It goes to 23% of workers are, are displaced in Santa Elena goes to 14%. Um, 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 and the homicide rates here, I want to give you some context about these numbers. Uh, the homicide rate is uh, per 100,000 inhabitants. And in a developed country, let's say UK, this number will be about seven or eight. 
more or less between seven and ten. And here we have in a, in 13 blocks, which is downtown, we have 79 homicides per every 100,000 inhabitants, which is huge, even for Latin America. And we are one of the most violent regions in the world. Uh, this is this is very, very high. And here I have other, other statistics which are as worrisome as the homicide rate. Another of the issues in terms of crime that we have been studying, particularly with Alison and Pete, is, is, is money, is payday lenders. We call them gota gota. And this is an illegal activity. And payday lenders are the, the few financial organizations, illegal and unregulated, but they are the only, the few ones who lend money for street vendors. Uh, in our data, we have that over 50% of the street vendors have a debt with a money put up with a pay with a payday lender. And here we have the distribution of the meal uh, workers, the people, the informal workers who work in the bus system, um, the proportion of them who are in debt. Over 50% and payday lenders charge about 20% of interest rates. Uh, and we find that even though this is another issue, which is very interesting, in another eight minutes, I will try to explain in another presentation. But street vendors in Cali before the pandemic, they had relatively high incomes, even higher than the minimum wage and the average citizen. But most of the money they earn goes to the payday lender. Um, Another, another thing that I want to show you here is the significant increase of street vendors in Cali. In 2014, and all this information is about is in downtown, in the area that I show you in the map, which is the largest concentration. In 2014, we did the first counting and it was, and it was to 1,000. In 2019, we in November, we count over 2,000 same year in December, we count 5,000. And with COVID-19, probably the number is even going to, to go up. We haven't been able to count them because with the pandemia, with the pandemic and everything, we haven't been able to do uh, to conduct a uh, field work. And last but not least, I want to show you some of the data about the impacts of the pandemic on informal workers in terms of their socioeconomic conditions. This is a work we have been doing with, with Brian. Nina, the, at this point in, a, in the face-to-face -face seminar, I'd be waving frantically at you. So we've got about a minute, I think, to, to okay. put it together. I, I'll finish in one minute. Uh, we got that uh, an income reduction of 50% of the, their income. Pretty much street vendors are, are living with less than $130. There is an increase in indebtedness, particularly with Gota Gota. Uh, these, these statistics here are incredibly high as compared with the national statistics. 58% of someone in the household was ill with COVID-19 and 34% lost someone during the pandemic. And this is one of the statistics that shows that poor people in the country have been overrepresented with COVID-19, um, all the implications that it have, and particularly to someone during the pandemic. And I'll stop there. Uh, Lina, muchísimas gracias. That, that was, um... I think that, that final slide in particular, I'm sure we'll we'll come back to because you really just did start to um to touch on it. Thank you so much for for keeping as close as you could to the eight minutes. There's so much to say. Um, so we're going to move to our last speaker for um, this first part of our session. So Jim Lee, um, if you have your your slides ready to to share. Yeah, sure. Can you hear my voice, Pete? Yeah, I can hear you nice and loud and clear, Jim Lee. Okay, thanks. Uh... I think you're about seven o'clock at night, aren't you? Yeah, 6.30, yeah. 6.30. <laughs> right, right, here we go. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, but if you just turn on the slideshow. There, there right, okay. Yeah, brilliant. Right, okay, uh, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to join this um, exciting event. Um, so my presentation today will focus on uh, streets in uh, Indonesia's informal settlements, uh, particularly 
about how they are managed, which is um, basically based on my PhD research that I did at uh, Cardiff University. Um, I had the privilege to work with Alison and Pete during my PhD. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me start with this question. Uh, why should we focus on street in informal settlements? Uh, why do we need to care about them? Um, for most of us, um, they may seem chaotic, intimidating, and most of them are hidden from the public. Um, I'm sure that not all of us have experience walking through streets in informal settlements. And uh, therefore, we may think that they are not significant to us or to the city, unlike any major streets that uh, we know. But as I went through the literature, uh, from my observation, it's clear for me that we need to pay attention on streets in informal settlements because nowadays urban streets have been becoming uh, more traffic oriented. And I'm speaking particularly in the context of cities in the global south. Um, they're mainly conceived, designed and managed to, to be monofunctional, to facilitate um, vehicular movement, marginalizing other important roles of the street as a public space, which contributes to the displacement and um, exclusion of marginalized communities. Um, with the increasing privatization and surveillance in the street, then the freedom of the public in general to use the street for different purposes is limited. And it is even worse for low income communities who often have to deal with um, harsh street cleansing policies targeting them because they are considered as an obstruction to public order or to traffic flow. Although we know that they largely depend on access to the street for their livelihoods, mostly through um, informal claims. And um, as they are chased away from public streets, um, I argue in my research that it's the claim of ordinary streets in informal settlements that is critical to their experience to the city. The claim to the ordinary streets in their own territory, in the place where most of these communities live. But however, um, informal settlements nowadays are no longer the same. As we know, them maybe 20 or 30 years ago, uh, what we know about their lack of tenure security or basic services or um, low quality housing is only part of the truth. Nowadays, with um, capital investments and um, government interventions, um, um, spaces inside informal settlements has been uh, transformed, making them more complex now. But we don't know much about how these spaces work. We don't know much about how uh, streets in informal settlements are produced used and managed, despite them often being the focus of interventions in uh, many upgrading programs. So then I studied um, to Kampung in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Kampung is a term that refers to vernacular urban settlements uh, in Indonesia that grow um, incrementally, and that's why they usually have um, organic special patterns. Uh, one is Kampung Keparakan, um, centrally located Kampung in the city center, uh, still related to the history of Yogyakarta Sultanate, which later grew after the invasion of um, the riverbank by squatters. The other one is Kampung Kricak, a peripheral Kampung at the city border that began with informal land subdivision by individual landlords who leased their land to homeless people who were affected by the government from a social institution where they used to live. Um, yeah, so, so how are streets managed in the two kampung that I studied? Yeah, my study found that management of kampung streets is situated in a tripartite nexus of community, land owner, and state. The involvement of state actors in the management of kampung is inherently political infrastructure investment in Kampung became a way to buy political support. I found the involvement of military uh, personnel in street construction projects in Kampung, particularly during an authoritarian military regime, which was used by the regime as a tool for social control 
to spy on grassroots communities and to boost the military's image. And also uh, the establishment of several bodies responsible for um, facilitating community participation in development projects, including um, street related projects, um, to control the process of decision making in the grassroots. It's also reported in my fieldwork that politicians often use street related projects to gain political support from campaign communities, particularly near elections, um, or to embezzle money uh, from government budget, which often involve informal politics play out between um, cities legislative and executive um, organizations. Um, yeah, but uh, the state is not the only actor involved in um, the management of Kampung streets. Land owner, land owners exercise their control of the land that they claim. Uh, landlords, as I thought, who lease their land to the tenants control plot allocation um, for the tenants and their consent is necessary to carry out any infrastructure projects on their land, including street related projects. While land occupiers who claim the ownership of the land, either formally or informally, are also eager to defend their perceived right to control, use, and maintain the streets adjacent uh, to their homes. Um, yeah, but let's not underestimate the role of community. Um, in the two kampung that I studied, communities have a major role in, major role in creating, um, claiming, and um, managing streets. Community and collective mechanism are essential for the process of all creating streets and for the functional, for the functioning and allocation uh, of um, streets for different activities. Um, this is a picture of the main access to a neighborhood in Kampung Krichak that I took um, during my field work in 2018. Um, a resident told me uh, a story of this street from maybe 20 years ago when resident his, in his neighborhood um, worked together and um, used anything uh, to um, open this street, um, literally anything like trash, uh, tires, or coconut shells, or whatever they could find. While in Kampong Kaparakan, uh, most streets and alleys are formed from voluntary setbacks uh, of land claimed by residents. Um, these are some pictures that I took showing uh, different types of activities taking place in the street. You can see children playing, uh, um, a woman cooking, or socializing, or um, hanging laundry, and many others. And you may wonder how these narrow organic streets in informal settlements can become uh, or can accommodate uh, these various activities. So uh, in Kampung, communities are tight-knit. Uh, they're willing to look after each other and to share. So uh, residents watch the street, creating um, a safe environment for children to play. Um, they know each other and they trust their fellow residents, making them confident to hang their laundry or put their belongings in the street without worrying that they, they, they are going to be stolen. Uh, they also allow temporary street closure for those who need space for ceremonial activities such as weddings or funeral and um, appropriation of the street by private actors for, let's say, economic or domestic activities, which is common, but um, often temporary and subject to community approval, which involves negotiation and um, consensus making in the process. Um, yeah, communities also play an important role in the day-to-day -day management uh, of Kampung streets okay. to ensure that Jimmy, their streets. So, so, sorry to interrupt you, Jimmy. We're, we're now yep. getting just past the 10 minutes, so try and just, just kind of okay. weave us towards the end of the presentation would be great. Sure. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, I just want to show that how they uh, play an important role uh, to protect the neighborhood, to make sure that um, their uh, streets are safe and um, uh, clean. So, well, this is the end of my presentation, actually, Pete. And I just want to say that we need to appreciate the lessons that uh, these settlements and low-income communities offer to our cities, um, particularly with regard to street management. 
um, they demonstrate an approach through which the street has been shared and um, transformed into a multifunctional and pedestrian friendly environment, which is vibrant, safe, and, and productive, which I think is crucial for the future of our cities. That's um, my presentation. Thanks. <laughs> thank, oh, Jim Lee, thank you so much. Sorry to have, you were literally there when I interrupted as well. If only I, I, <laughs> I, I won't talk for any more. I'm going to go straight to the questions because we've already got a couple in the in the chat bar. So I'll, I'll go in order that they came and then just um, they're directed at particular speakers. So if you just come in. Um, so Luis uh, has asked to Sam, can you please elaborate what you mean by the rigidity of the, the built profession, if that was his uh, correct understanding. And I, I also thought, you know, it was interesting when you talked about, you know, it becomes interesting when the professionals leave. But I wonder whether, Hassan, you could elaborate on that. That's that's a great question. Thanks. Yeah, so that's that's the part I mentioned. So becoming particularly interested in 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 in, in how and when the professionals leave, and that's where uh, the, the ordinary takes over. And the examples that I've just shown at the end of the work was particularly related to case study in Cape Town, which was uh, a formal layout has been uh, has been put in place and then becoming informalized over time. So it it raises the question about the role of the building environment professions that I mentioned, and particularly in regard to the ways in which we tend to fix the final form or the tendency to become fixed on the final outcome. So if, if we look at a range of upgrading projects across different contexts, we notice that upgrading is not actually the end point, is actually the start point. And people take over even after the upgrading process in place. So there is perhaps a kind of, again, again a misconception that upgrading is gonna finalize or fix the final layout of a settlement here in the context of informal settlements, which is not necessarily the case, and adaptations take place immediately after the upgrading process. And in, in, in some of the cases, for example, in the case of Puna in, in Yeravada, which was one of the uh, internationally recognized upgrading projects incrementally in situ upgrading, that uh, uh, informal adaptations take place uh, at the same time and just immediately also after finishing the project, that adding a floor, extending, also encroaching on public space. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. Um, great. So the next one is is for you, Lena, um, and from Juan, who's a, a fellow Caleno. Um, so, you yeah, uh, know, uh, Juan talks about the, you know, how insightful it was to learn about informal street vending and, and the patterns you observe. But the question is whether the, the current um, Paddle Nacional, um, there's a lot of focus in the news on the impact of protests on formal businesses, but not much on street vendors and the informal economy. And obviously you, you said that there were more people entering the informal economy post COVID. So whether you've got any sense of what impact the Paddle is, is having on, on street vending, street vendors and their families? Well, Every day that street vendors are enabled to be in the streets is one day they are enabled to eat. In the pandemic, in the survey we collect, we found about three months that they were, at least three months that they were unable to, to work. Now, during the, during the riots, the national riots, um, I, yesterday I was, well, I was in a meeting and we were discussing the data about another information for uh, informal workers that 87% were unable to run um, in, the, in, in normal conditions their business, which means a significant loss on their, on their income. So yes, it, the riots had a significant impact on the livelihoods of the street vendors and informal workers in general. Uh, which adds to all the complications and the socioeconomic difficulties they were living as a consequence of the pandemic. For the whole country, including informal workers, it was like everything was really bad because of the pandemic and it went even worse after, after the riots. Okay, th thanks Lena, thanks for, for responding. Um, I can't see, oh yes, we've got one from, oh Adrian, that's cheating because you're part of the team, you're presenting. But anyway, it's better than me coming up with one. Um, Adrian, so you're, um, again, thanks for all the great presentations. It says, Alison, you spoke about a replacement economy. Does this term 
reify the notion of of a, a formal economy as the norm interesting question yeah. i think i think there's always a problem with terminology isn't there adrian that that informality implies othering or to some extent outside the the norm so i think i think it's a problem with with terminology but i, I found it very difficult to to move to something else in india they call in in, in the informal sector the unorganized sector which is possibly true, although there is quite a level of organization. And I think what, um, I, I think the, the argument or the term that we were trying to look at was to recognize that informality exists in, in many uh, contexts and in many urban services, but it's quite often exacerbated. And the issue is, does that exacerbation give us the opportunity to, um, to think about different ways of short-term recovery because if you're looking in post-conflict situations it's often characterized by the collapse of governance so things stop working transport stops working or the waste is no longer collected so so what are people doing to help themselves and how much of that is just the ongoing of existing uh, situations and how much is is continuing great question thanks adrian yeah, a good question. In the absence of others, I'm I'm going to keep you on the spotlight, Professor Brown. Um, and that that's to to you, I, I love the fact that in the work because you were looking engaging with the humanitarian aid literatures and, and policies and practices, you talk of the, the do no harm principle that actually hadn't previously been applied to the informal economy. I wonder whether it and that's the way you applied it. So this idea of doing no harm in your response to the informal economy. I wonder if you want to just elaborate on what what you mean by that. Um, I, th I think the, the short answer is that it's very easy to destroy jobs, but it's very difficult to create them. And that's what local economic development has been trying to do for, for a long period of time. Um, the, I had some material on literatures, but I saw you looking over my shoulder, Pete, and it all got cut out last night. <laughs> But, but we've, we've applied, you know, a whole range of literature from the kind of legislation and urban rights to, um, to the notion of livelihoods, to, um, to all the debates within the informal economy. Um, and I, I think possibly there are two underlying principles uh, under that that I would suggest. The first is to understand the processes. And I think Hassan made a really important point that you have to understand the context to understand the way that informality works. Um, and the, uh, the, so the, to understand the, uh, the context, and then secondly, to understand the vulnerabilities. So what happens if you evict people? And what happened from their place of work as, or their place of, of dwelling? Who are the dependents? What is the chain of reactions as a result of that eviction? So if you understand the processes through which people survive, and seek to reduce those vulnerabilities in, in that. So that, that um, is the principle that I think we concluded from our research. Um, and again, it is situated within, within various literatures, but that, that was a, it was a shorthand given my eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. We've got, we've got four minutes left and there's a... Um, da, da, da. Um, Oh, I'm just, sorry, it was a message direct to me in the chat that I don't need to read out. Uh, okay, so there's, there's no more questions there. So I'm going to keep using my chair's prerogative um, because I, I just think there was so much. You, you all had to cut your, your talks very, uh, very short. Uh, Jim Lee, you, you kind of concluded, and I know that was just a snapshot of a, you know, your thesis of your 80,000 words, but you talked about lessons that settlements can offer us. And, and you know, this whole session was about global normalization of informality. And there was so much that we could learn, I think, in the global north from what was happening in the informal settlements. Do you want to spend a bit of time, just two or three minutes, elaborating on, on what those lessons were? Uh, yeah. Um, well, my, my study found that um, um, informality plays a great role in you know, stimulating um, like um, interactions on the street to, to create a lively place in informal settlements. But they, um, these communities also demonstrate capacity to, to capitalize from their limited resources um, to create safe. Um, they do you know, uh, night patrol, 
um, watch, night watch the patrol the neighborhood. Um, they do a waste collection service, um, criminal waste collection service. So it shows us how this community are able to produce, to co-produce uh, spaces and basic services in addition to um, government initiatives. But we really have to, I think, appreciate their capacity, their involvement in the process. So it's, it's very important, I think, uh, to uh, give the freedom of these communities to, um, to, to decide what is best for them and then to involve them in the process of making the spaces inside their settlements. And uh, yeah, yeah.